so the topic today was well introduced. We're going to talk about this gender affirmative therapy or using hormones and surgeries and to change, quote unquote, change a person's sex and how this relates to children and the dangers of this. Um, next slide, please. Okay, start with a quote here. This most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. Who said that? Sir Isaac Newton. And you may know Newton from your school days described uh, laws of motion and used mathematics to describe physics, and he, he was quite a genius and also a believer in the God of the Bible, like myself. But you don't have to be a believer in the Bible or anything in particular to be affected by the laws of motion. If you've ever tripped or, God forbid, gone downstairs, uh, you, there it was physics in operation. Um, and so whether you believe in physics or not, whether you believe in chemistry or physiology or, or not, these things are going to affect you. Your belief doesn't change reality. Uh, next slide, please. And here we are. Can you defy the laws of physics? I don't know how high he is up in the tree. Let's say he's up 14 feet. Uh, looks like he's in for trouble. Now, if he believed he was a helium balloon, would that help him? Uh, if he thought he was a bird, could that help him? And by that, you know, I don't mean to poke fun of people or kids with gender dysphoria, but the people, the intellectuals, the physicians, psychologists, educators who are pushing this false idea about sex and gender. Uh, next slide, please. We go back a little further. So endocrinologist, what is an endocrinologist? People often say, well, that's great. What is, what is that exactly? Well, we study glands and hormones. So some of you here may even have a thyroid condition. There's a thyroid hormone that we treat uh, problems with, or diabetes because of insulin as a hormone, things like that. And it also comes down to the sex organs. Uh, testicles make testosterone. Ovaries make estrogen. Male and female hormones fall under what we do, so we diagnose and treat these types of conditions. And so that's why this topic falls into to our domain. Um, a couple, I think I would say three years ago, by the way, this transgenderism really wasn't taught in our training. It was always kind of a, a fringe sort of issue. Now, about three years ago, a mom continually called my office to get their 19-year-old adopted son to my office because he wanted to transition from a, a male to a female. And I said, you know, we don't deal with that, we don't treat that sort of condition, but she was persistent, and she let the staff know that, you don't understand, I don't, I don't want this to happen. I want him to hear what are the potential harms that can come from this. Everywhere he goes, and this is in, in Rockland, California, near Sacramento, everywhere he goes, they're pushing him towards these hormones and surgeries. I need to hear a different perspective. So I went and read up on it, did some research, and presented it to the, to the boy and his mom, and I found out a number of harms, which I'll describe here. And I'm not quite sure what happened to him. I just saw him for an educational session, um, and he didn't become a patient or anything like that. But that came and went, and I, I didn't understand the scope of what was going on at that time. Fast forward to, I believe it's 2017, uh, which he just described now, this book, I Am Jazz. Has anyone heard of this book? Or is anyone familiar or familiar with the controversy in Rockland? Yeah, I, you know, this got as far as Fox News even, and I, I was um, listening to what was going on. That's really interesting. Here I am, an endocrinologist in Rockland. I should find out more about what's going on. So I met some of the parents, the parent I know who he just described, whose child was so disturbed by what went on. When her hair was pressed up against her head, she came out of the shower, she thought she was turning into a boy, because if you're five, you don't know. You know, they've shown that, you know, if you put a, a boy sees that they can wear a dress, might think they can actually become a girl, simply by the clothes that they're wearing. So this is a very tender age group with different perceptions of, of reality. By the way, I just want to say, I do have some um, slides here that discuss puberty. It's, a, it's in a di diagram form, but people may feel a little bit uncomfortable, or I don't think there's any kids here. Um, and some, no pictures, but some graphic descriptions of um, operations, just so you know. Um, so anyways, I talked to the parents and <clears throat> they were concerned and, and the woman said, you know, read this book, you know, as an endocrinologist, tell me what you think about this book, I Am Jazz. So I did. 
And one of the things that the said in there is that, you know, when I was young, I was diagnosed as transgender. And I said, how could you know a five-year-old is transgender? How would they know that? Um, I have a, a boy's body but a girl brain. Is there any scientific truth to that? But it was being presented as though it were true to five-year-olds and six-year-olds. So what I did is I went back, this is kind of interesting, you know, I went back to my original source called Up to Date, which is one of our med medical sources, to get the information I used to tell that other 19-year-old kid. And do you know what happened to that source? It disappeared. But I had remembered some of the studies, and I went back and I researched, I'm like, I'm going to figure out what's going on. And I wrote a letter to the school board in Newcastle, and I said, hey, you want to teach about this book? Well, here's the other side of the equation. Here are all the different problems you're going to have from hormones, from puberty blockers, from surgeries, from social transition. You need to teach this side of it, too, which, of course, they didn't. But I presented this to, I had been in contact, I don't know if anyone knows this person's name, Walt Heyer. He lived as a female for, I think, 11 years. He's a male, lived as a female, and transitioned back to being a male and realized the horrible mistake that he had made. He had a lot of psychological conditions, he had trauma, he had abuse, sexual abuse and things like that, which nobody ever investigated. He went to psychologists and doctors. Nobody would look into his underlying problems and so, since he's come out of that, he's written a number of books. If you look at Walt Heyer, H-E-Y-E-R, on YouTube, you can see his video, his testimony. It's very interesting. But I, I had been in contact, him, and I said, could you read my letter? Because <clears throat> I want to I make sure I'm being factual, and I want to make sure that I, I'm not out to hurt anybody, or any, I just want kids to not be harmed. And he said, you know what, Mike, this is great. Not only that, I'm going to send it to my editor. So long story short, it got published. And that's led me to go to a lot of different places that he described to Washington, D.C., even to Parliament to talk about this. Um, and he was talking earlier about Twitter. Um, I am not able to tweet out anything about this conference because I'm banned on Twitter right now, if you can believe it. <laughs> they banned me two or three weeks ago. <laughs> you can see my page, but I can't interact or do anything. So, But that gives you an idea of this sort of digital dictatorship and authoritarian system that this is bringing about in our society, when I can't just talk about medical facts. Uh, next slide, please. That's the, that's the article I wrote. Next slide, please. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is go over some definitions. Um, how do we identify sex? Uh, what is normal sexual development? Talk more about gender dysphoria. Uh, gender affirmative therapy, which is hormones and surgery, uh, and the dangers, and then the future, what, what can we do about this? Next slide, please. So, start with the definition. What, what is gender dysphoria? Has anyone heard that term before, gender dysphoria? Okay. Um, technical defini definition, it's a mismatch between a person's physical sex and their mind's perception of their sex, which leads to significant distress, an impairment of functioning lasting at least six months. So this is, you know, as a kindergarten child had a, was a boy, believed they were a girl, and the distress that accompanies that. And it can happen at any age. If you look at children, we use a fancy term, desistance, but it just means how many of these kids will grow out of it as they've studied it? Anywhere between 61 to 98 percent, depending on the study. So maybe roughly 80, 90 percent of kids will just grow out of it if, you know, either helped with counseling or, or left on their own. Which begs the question, how are you going to identify, like jazz, well, that's when I was told I was transgender. Well, who knows that? What kind of tests do you do to figure that out? How can you tell a kid that, well, you're actually transgender? We'll discuss that. Um, next slide. Now, this is coming out um, in, the, in the legal realm. Um, this was a case, Drew Adams versus School Board of St. John's, Florida. And so they describe about gender identity. Has anyone heard that term, gender identity? Would it be defined as a person's core internal sense of their own gender? So what, you have a body, but what is, what is in your mind, do you believe that body to be? You're, you're, you have male body parts, do you believe you're a male? If you're female, you believe you're a female. If you have a mismatch, 
that's the problem we're talking about. Now, the problem is, in the legal realm and in, even in the medical field, they're going a step further in saying this gender identity is the primary factor in determining a person's sex. Does that sound right to you? Or is it your body parts? I mean, it's just logical stuff. But this is, this is what, what we're seeing. Um, next slide, please. So the question is, where can I find this gender identity? Uh, can, there's a CT on the left. Can you see it in there? Can I see it in there? Uh, there's an MRI on the right. Is it there in the back? There it is. I would move to the front. Uh, is there a blood test? Can you check genetics? On and on and on. Is there a medical test for this? Can you find it? You cannot. There, is, there isn't. It's a concept. It's a feeling that's in someone's mind. You're going to find a feeling on an EEG or some other test? You can't. Uh, next slide, please. So myself and colleagues um, wrote a letter to our endocrine society. That's our main medical society for endocrinologists. Wrote a letter to the editor about potential harms. First of all, you can't really identify this, where the gender identity is, or what it is in any objective way. Uh, you don't have the tests, but yet you're going to give these very powerful hormones at high doses to kids and surgeries. If your child, God forbid, had cancer, would you want to make sure the doctor got a biopsy to diagnose it before they gave them very powerful chemotherapeutics that, themselves, that are poisonous but meant to wipe out the cancer or radiation or surgery? But here, they have nothing other than what the child says or the teenager, and they're going to do very radical things to him, them, which I'll describe. Um, next slide, please. So how do we identify sex? And there's, like I said, there's some diagrams coming up, but um, there's only two sexes. Um, you're here and you're... you're uh, <laughs> there's no more. <clears throat> it's not a spectrum. There's not 48,000 of them. Um, there's only two. Uh, and you, it seems common sense. The Bible says it. Genesis 5.2, he, God, created them male and female and blessed them. And it's in some other sections. Um, so if you just read the Bible, it's very simple. If you turn to scientists, they're going to confuse you, but there's only two sexes. How do we know that? You can do a thought experiment. Just start with your own self when you were a single cell and go backwards. <laughs> it came, the sperm came from a male, that's your father. Egg came from a female, that's your mother. And there's no other way about it. There are no aliens or anything else. <laughs> Next slide, please. Well, what if we want to look into the science? Uh, you've probably all heard of chromosomes, 23 pairs in the human, and kind of hard to see here, but down the bottom, right on each side, there's male on the left, female on the right. You've got XY for male, XX for female. That's, that's another way you can identify it. There are a very small proportion of people who have disorders of development um, and may be difficult, at least at birth, to determine their, their sex organs, um, or they may have chromosomal abnormalities, but actually that is, does not um, relate to this subject here. Here we're talking about kids with normal body parts who believe they're of a, of a different sex, or believe they're non-binary, or believe something else. Next slide, please. Again, sex is identified at birth. Sometimes you'll hear this, sex is assigned at birth. Like the doctor and nurse, well, we'll assign this one a male, I guess, and maybe that one female today. Um, you know, how do you know, ask any grandma, how do you identify sex? Or mother, or even kids who have younger siblings. They, well, it's this one is a male, that's, that's a boy and that's a girl. We all know that. But some people don't seem to know that. Next slide, please. Um, the body is amazing. I mean, I, I like, I love endocrinology because it teaches you about human physiology, um, development. It's, it's very fascinating. Um, these are some stages of, of development of the baby. Now, you start out with chromosomes, as I mentioned, and then from there you develop the, um, the sex organs. And that happens around week 8 to 12 of development. 
Next slide, please. Yeah. This is a bit complicated, probably hard to see, but at the very top, what it's showing you is that, you know, we start out from a single cell, and, and many things look, appear the same as the, as the baby develops, at least in, until week eight. There are the gonads, which are the testicles or ovaries, start out in a primordial form, and then they differentiate or change one to the other. So on the left, it's showing how there's a change for the male, there's testicles and all of the different associated vas deferens and things like that that go with it. On the female on the right, you develop, of course, uterus, vagina, and that sort of thing. But the point here is that in red, there's a certain type of tubule, and in blue, there's a certain type of tubule. Once you go down one pathway, the other one disappears, and vice versa. So very early on, it's determined in terms of your physical appearance, and glands and such, very early on there's a split, a bifurcation, and you can't switch back again at that point. You can't, you can't switch, it's already been predetermined. Um, next slide, please. So, unlike the heart or the lungs, which when you're born they're essentially fully functioning, the sex organs go through further development at what we call puberty. And if you take your child, grandchild to pediatrician, they can determine the stage of puberty, we call Tanner stages, and this will be important, um, based on physical appearance. So there's five Tanner stages, so there's male on the left, female on the right, and based on changes in pubic hair pattern or testicle size for the males, uh, breast growth and pu uh, pubertal hair distribution, the female that can decide what Tanner stage that they're in. And this is important to know that the, the children are going through their normal development that they should. Somewhere around uh, stage three or four, that's where fertility is established. In other words, males can make sperm, uh, females can uh, release ovum and have uh, menstruation and so forth. And then five is a, a adult, adult form. Okay, so, that, so I've gone over normal physiology. Um, next slide, please. And talk a bit about, more about gender dysphoria. This is kind of hard to see too, but basically what you're seeing is over the last decade, this is a, a gender identity service in the uh, United Kingdom. There's been a 4,400% increase in referrals to the clinic there. And in yellow, those are, those are female adolescents, um, and then there's, and there's males and then there's children. But the point is, it was mainly males coming in, and now they're seeing mainly females, and the numbers are increasing dramatically. Why is that happening? Next slide. Uh, Dr. Lisa Littman uh, did an important study where she discussed or took surveys of parents who had children or adolescents with this uh, gender dysphoria condition and found a lot of interesting things. Uh, most of them were female. They had a sudden change in gender identity. It wasn't like they were five and had this confusion. It happened later in life. I've spoken to some of these parents myself and said, you know, my girl uh, wore dresses and, and uh, nail polish and bracelets and such, and then suddenly, it was always a girly girl, but suddenly developed this male persona. Um, many of the kids have uh, autism or some type of psychiatric uh, condition. Um, many of these kids were on social media and YouTube watching videos with these groomers out there teaching them how to get testosterone or how to get pills or how to talk to their doctor or how to convince them that they, they are what they are to get these medications. And social contagion seems to play a role too. They'll come out in clusters. Well, if this is so rare, why is it you and three of your friends have this condition? Because there's a social contagion component. Uh, next slide, please. Now, try to explain this. Um, what's the long-term effects? I'm gonna go into details about these hormones, but what eventually happens to these? You could say, well, fine, they believe they're the opposite sex, why not just let them have the treatment? Um, they're gonna be great, right? They're gonna feel better, they're gonna be better. This is a slide out of, out of uh, Sweden, and because they have a database of all their um, patients, they're able to show um, people basically over time will, will die off um, 
for, through different causes. At the top, there's males and females, those top two lines, and so that's the curve of over time, over 30 years, you can see that people over time will die of different conditions. The bottom two li um, dashed lines show that these were people who were, uh, who were transgender identifying and had surgeries and had hormones. And you can see around year 10, can you see where it falls? Can you see where that line falls? That means more and more people are dying. So if this treatment helps so much, why is there this giant fall off on the curve where people are dying off at around 10 years? When I spoke to Walt Heyer, who I mentioned earlier, he said, yeah, when I, he runs a site, sexchangeregret.com. He goes, yeah, it's right around 10 years where people realize that I made a mistake. I'm not really a female. These hormones are hurting me. And the rate of suicide completion was 19 times higher than, than the population, than the normal population of Sweden, or the people not affected. Um, psychiatric hospitalizations were higher. Um, suicide attempts were higher and so forth. So this is ultimately dangerous. Next slide, please. What would be the best way to help kids with this condition, do you think? Probably talk to them and find out what's really going on. Uh, do they have autism? Do they have depression? Do they have anxiety? If they're older, they might have bipolar disorder, uh, schizophrenia. Have they been abused physically or sexually? Um, or if they're young, maybe simple family problems. A new uh, daughter came along and the boy felt left out and want, wanted to dress like the daughter to get more attention, that sort of thing. This is what should be happening, but is, is not happening in many cases. And children need counseling and family counseling, but in this state, to my knowledge, uh, if you wanted to say, well, my child has gender dysphoria, I'm gonna, treat, I'm gonna take them to be treated to help align their mind and body, it's illegal, to my, to my knowledge. Um, so you have to go out of state. But the point is, anyone can help their children through these other types of conditions. And to me, this is just a manifestation of something else going on. It's not a, it's not a condition in, in and of itself where someone has the wrong brain and the wrong body. Next. Uh, so, what's the opposite of helping kids to align their body and mind? Uh, it's called different names, but gender affirmative therapy. There's four stages to this. Social transition, like what happened uh, in Rockland, where you know, a girl starts wearing uh, clothes that look more like the opposite sex, and uh, a boy may start wearing dresses and so forth. So the idea is to socially transition to get them ready when they're older to continue on in this, in this mode. Puberty blocking hormones to stop the process that I described earlier, and I'll, I'll talk about that more. Cross-sex hormones, taking opposite of the hormones that are opposite of your sex. And finally, surgeries. Next slide, please. So, again, endocrinology is very interesting to me. It may, may not be to you. I'll try to make it simple. <laughs> uh, simple <laughs> story is that there's a gland behind your eyes called the pituitary. Has anyone heard of that gland? Minute? Okay. So it's sometimes called the master gland, and it controls other glands in your body, like the thyroid, for example. It also controls uh, the sex organs, the testicles, to make uh, testosterone, the ovaries to make estrogen. And so normally there's signaling happens, and that's what causes, initiates puberty, and then through adulthood, you have these hormones uh, starting. Next slide. Now this, that's a mouthful up there, if you can see it. Hypogonadotropic hypogonadism which basically means there's a, there's a blockage there. Right? The pituitary is not sending the signal out. Um, and this is a medical condition that endocrinologists like myself would work up and treat. There's something wrong with the pituitary. It's not sending out signals. And so we're gonna treat that by either helping to fix the pituitary or having them get hormones of, of their actual sex. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, are there any medications which can cause this condition? There are. Has anyone heard of Lupron before? Prostate, it's a prostate cancer medication. Why does that work? Well, if you give that medication, it, it actually blocks the pituitary and it prevents in the male from making testosterone and that helps prevent basically the spread and growth of prostate cancer. So there's a legitimate use for, for doing this in medicine. It's also used for endometriosis 
or sometimes kids start puberty at a very young age, say four years old. These are all labeled uses by the FDA. Next slide. What about using it for kids, say they're 12 or 13 with this gender confusion? What about stopping puberty so that they can become the opposite sex, theoretically? Is this FDA approved in any way? Has it been tested? It has not. You know, there are a lot of people talking about conversion therapy, and we have to ban conversion therapy, and they're never clear what that is. But here's a clear conversion using chemicals of a person's body, which is extremely harmful. Next slide, please. So what are the effects? Now, the, the Endocrine Society, which I referenced earlier, and their guidelines, which are all low-quality evidence, say that as soon as the, the kid develops this and starts pubertal development at, uh, at Tanner Stage 2, that's when you give these medications. What's going to happen? You're going to stop pubertal development. You're also going to inhibit normal brain development and bone development, which I'll talk about. And importantly, they won't come to that stage to become fertile. So, so long as they're on this medication, they're infertile. If they continue on to hormones, they'll remain infertile. If they have surgery, they'll be sterilized. This is a path towards sterilization of kids. Next slide. Now, how young are these being given? I, I had a, there was an undercover video, it's not coming out, but basically this is right here in our state, UC San Francisco. Uh, Elena Scherer at one of their gender-bending conferences discussing how, yo how young would kids get this. And she states flatly that they could be as young as eight or nine years old. Um, they could be in third or fourth grade. And think about what you were doing at that time, maybe pretending you were a knight or a fairy, or I was uh, under my coffee table. I thought I had a rocket ship and I could make it to Mars. Uh, I haven't, haven't made it. But <laughs> the point is, you know, kids think out, the kids fantasize, and it's normal. When should we start taking that as gospel truth and giving them these powerful medications to, at UCSF and Children's Hospital Los Angeles? Eight or nine is just fine with them. Next slide, please. Um, what are the consequences of giving these medications to males on the left, you're going to stunt growth of their organs, as I said. They're going to develop sexual dysfunction because the organs never developed correctly. They're going to prevent sperm production, as I said, and disrupt normal brain and bone development. For females, at a young age, they'll actually acquire a menopause-like state because they're not getting proper hormones. It will block normal breast development. They'll also have sexual dysfunction. You'll also cause infertility, as I said, and affect bone and brain development. Next slide. Um, what about effects on the mind or on the brain? We, as I said earlier, these kids are coming, look at one study, 70% of them already had some sort of underlying psychological condition, autism and such. What effect does it have on the mind? I pulled actually the first three, it's probably hard to see, but from the labeling, emotional lability, mood changes, headaches, nervousness, anxiety, agitation, confusion, delusions, insomnia, depression. It even says, monitor for development or worsening of psychiatric symptoms. Use with caution in patients with a history of psychiatric illness. Does that sound safe to you for these kids? Um, in the UK, they're doing very good work uncovering what's going on at their uh, gender identity service. Uh, Professor Biggs out of Oxford, through freedom of information request, uh, got some further information for what they're doing there, and he found that there was no st statistically significant difference in psychological functioning in blockers versus support. So whether they got blockers or they were just psychologically supported, it, there was no difference. It wasn't really helping them. Children actually reported greater self-harm. You've heard of kids cutting or doing things like that. The, the incidents went up. Um, and girls exhibited more behavioral and emotional problems and greater dissatisfaction with their body. Uh, next slide. Just a, a little bit about uh, bone development. So these are sometimes called puberty blockers. I think they should be called development blockers because it's not only affecting the or, uh, sex organs, but also even bone. Your bone grows in density. It becomes more strong through puberty because of these uh, sex hormones. And so 
They've done some small studies of these kids on puberty blockers. That, that blue graph in the middle shows that they, they started out, these girls started out with kind of a lower bone density compared to, the, compared to their peers. And as time went on in year one and year two, which is in red, you can see how much lower they are than compared to their peers as far as bone density. Um, and I don't have it shown exactly, but they're basically in the lower 3% of bone density for their age group, which puts them at risk, of course, for osteoporosis and fractures and all kinds of things. Not good. So next slide, please. So now I'm going to talk about cross-sex hormones, which I just call wrong sex hormones. Um, now, just puberty blockers real quick. When, when they studied some of these kids on puberty blockers, 100% of them decided to go on to take these cross-sex hormones. And wouldn't you, if you had all those problems I just described, and think, well, this must be my way out. But it's not a way out. It's just compounding the problem. This is showing uh, female levels of testosterone. Now, females do have some smaller amount of testosterone. They prim primarily make estrogen, and vice versa. Males primarily make testosterone, but they have some small levels of estrogen. And the blue, from somewhere 10 to 50, is a normal level for the female adult testosterone. Certain conditions you may or may not have heard of, like polycystic ovarian syndrome, may, may have heard of. Women can develop higher than normal testosterone levels and may get uh, problems with acne, affects menstrual function, hair on the face, and other places. And that's something that endocrinologists treat. Um, endocrine tumors of the adrenal gland can cause really high amounts of testosterone. That's what you see in red, up to 1,000. And what are they recommending for people who want to, quote unquote, transition sex? Recommending to get these levels th th 300 to 1,000. That's some 10 to 40 times higher than what their bodies would ordinarily produce. Does that sound safe to you or like a good idea? It's not a good idea. Um, these are super high doses of hormones. And what they'll do is they'll just lie, frankly. They replied to our letter and said, well, we're not giving high doses of hormones. We're just treating them based on their gender identity, which is a nothing. <laughs> but that's how they're justifying this in the medical world. Next. Slide, please. Um, what are side effects of these taking these high-dose wrong sex hormones? Um, for the male and female, they have increased risk of myocardial infarction, which means heart attack and death from cardiovascular disease. Uh, for the male, they've got five times increased risk of thromboembolism, which are blood clots, deadly blood clots. Uh, other possibilities are gallstones, high triglycerides, breast cancer risk goes up for males, and some males do get breast cancer, and the risk goes up. Gynecomastia is the abnormal production of breast tissue in the male, um, and that's going to happen. And of course, there's no FDA approval for, for, for this, for this condition. For females, again, the increased risk of heart attack and death, um, increase in red blood cell count, that's what erythrocytosis is. Uh, severe liver dysfunction is a possibility, high blood pressure, Increased risk of different cancers like breast, uterine, ovarian cancer. And then, of course, they're going to get hirsutism, which is abnormal hair growth on the face, face um, chest, or other areas, and changes or deepening of the voice. And the important thing about that is it's not like once these things happen, well, we'll just stop giving the medication. It will reverse itself. It, it doesn't. These are permanent changes. And, you know, I've been in contact with uh, females who've done this and said, you know, I've I can't believe I did this, you know, to my voice or my face or I have to get laser or, you know, I, I, I can't afford the treatment for this. It's not reversible. I wish the doctors told me what was going to happen. Next slide, please. Um, yes. So what are other um, side effects of this treatment in terms of using high-dose testosterone on females and... Um, what will happen psychologically? Well, they've shown really from bodybuilders and people who are abusing testosterone or other athletes, male and female, that there's increase in irritability, aggressiveness, uh, grandiose beliefs, hyperactivity, reckless or dangerous behavior. Uh, psychiatric symptoms become more common and severe as the dose increases, and we know these kids already have problems. Studies have shown that 23% of subjects using high doses of steroids uh, meet psychological criteria for a major mood syndrome, like mania or depression, and 3 to 12% developed 
actual psychotic symptoms. Another thing that's on that list, if you might have seen I skipped over, is euphoria. Everyone probably knows what euphoria is. It's really good feeling. Well, it is a drug. You're taking it in a high dose. For a time, you're going to feel great. This is the greatest thing in the world. Yes, it must be true. I'm taking testosterone. I feel great. It must, my body must not really be female. I'm, I'm meant to take this medication. Or I'm taking this high dose of estrogen, and everything's cool and smooth with me. This is fantastic. But we know what happens down the road 10 years later from that slide I showed you. I mean, I've, through, through this work, I've, I have a friend uh, who was a uh, transgender male, uh, took estrogen to be female, and his friend told him, you know, you should stop taking this medication. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt you. And eventually he listened, and he stopped, and he said, it was like snapping out of a haze, because the, the medication was making me feel good and smooth and cool. And then once I stopped, I realized what I was doing to my body. So there, there's a psychological effect to this that isn't talked about. And it's promoted as, oh, we're helping these kids. We've done this psychological study and see how much better they're doing. Well, yeah, you're taking high doses of drugs. What if you gave these kids high doses of THC, marijuana, or opiates, or something like that? They might feel really good, too. But that's not ultimately going to help them. Next slide, please. Just to emphasize, there's no FDA approval for, for these uses that I've described. And this is straight from UCSF's website, uh, unless they've taken it down at this point. Next slide, please. Has anyone heard of breast binders for these teenage kids? Um, I had known nothing about it at the time. The goal is to make a, a flat chest and a male-like appearance before they've ever had surgery. And so methods used include buying some, a commercial product like this, or some have used elastic bandages or duct tape or plastic wrap. Does that sound healthy to you? In the study of chest binding, people reported, uh, women, you know, young, young women reported complications, or young girls. Side effects included chest pain in 48%, shoulder pain 39%, back pain 53%, shortness of breath 46%, breast tenderness, skin changes, and a multitude of other harms. In another study, it was actually shown that lung function and chest wall size were affected um, in a bad way because of this harmful practice. You can't get enough air, as you can imagine. You're, you're stuffed and you're pressed inside there. And, but this is being advocated on the internet, and like I said, you can go into social media in different places, and this is fantastic. I, I wore my binder eight hours last night, and it was tough, but I'm making it through. I'm making it to the next stage. And what is the next stage? Next slide, please. So, surgical conversion therapy. Now, this picture, maybe some of you have seen it, was in a Federalist article. Um, people said, you know, that, that's, a, that's a male up there, right? It's a fem that's a female. This is a female, and you can see the effects of, a, of the hormones I was talking about. The male-type uh, growth pattern of hair on, on the abdomen, uh, down by the belly button. You can see the 5 o'clock shadow there. But worse than that, this, this woman has had a mastectomy, and that's why the binder is there now, and there's fluids coming out and such. They've had a mastectomy. Anyone care to guess how young they're doing these mastectomies? on kids in this state. Next slide, please. This is from Journal of American Medical Association, Pediatrics 2018. You can look it up, Johanna Olson Kennedy. Here's a graph of all the people they've done chest surgery on. Uh, by age group at the bottom, if you can see it, and then numbers. So 13-year-olds, they're on the left. They're, they had two 13-year-olds who had mastectomies. Uh, what is it, five, 14-year-olds, and so forth, all the way up through young adulthood. Do you think they're able to make that decision at that age, at 13? Can you get organs back? Can you get breasts back later? Well, I made a mistake. When I'm 26, I, this was wrong. I'll just get my breasts back again, or my testicles, or my ovaries. Is that possible? It's not possible. Next slide. Here's, here's some other undercover, but I, I don't uh, have the video. But next slide. The same Johanna Olson Kennedy. Uh, you can see the quote there. I'm um, wrapping it up. 
uh, you can see the quote there. Basically, she says, if you want breasts later in life, you can just go and get them. This is the researcher doing that. Um, how much time do I have? Um, none. Of, none, okay. <laughs> next, next, <laughs> next slide. Briefly, surgical conversion therapy. I'll just tell you about jazz real quick. By stopping, by stopping at Tanner stage two, the organs are very small and it makes the surgery very complicated. What they have to do in some cases is actually pull out a seg segment of colon and put it in place with the inverted penis skin into a surgical wound to make this false vagina. All, all these type of surgeries are very complicated and there's female to male surgeries. All have complications and, and are not really reversible. Next slide, please. Where are we headed? Now, I, I put this here, and it's, it is not happening, but I'm saying it could happen. The age of hormones when they were give, the Dutch were giving uh, testosterone to girls was 16, and then it got moved down to age 12. And we uncovered in our research that an NIH-funded researcher had it so they could give testosterone to girls as young as age 8. But how can you stop kids from getting puberty blockers? You could actually remove their sex organs, and then they wouldn't need to take puberty blockers and then just give them a hormone. I'm not saying that should be done, but it's within the realm of possibility because there's no stopping what's going on. There, there, aren't an, and there are some of us speaking out, but there's not enough to make changes uh, at the level of government and our medical societies to stop this from happening. Next slide. Uh, we'll just go next slide, please. What can parents do? I think this is important. Uh, find a counselor or psychologist, psychiatrist who does not follow the gender affirmative paradigm you're probably looking at out of state. There are some parent support groups uh, like the Kelsey Coalition and Parents of ROGD Kids, if you or someone you know has a child with this problem. Uh, American College of Pediatricians, Michelle Cotella, you may not know that name, is an excellent organization to get factual information. Next slide, please. What can we do in education and government just to follow on other people? You know, I started with a letter to my school board, and here, here I am speaking today. Get to your teachers, your, your counselors, your student counselors, your government officials ahead of time. A lot of people don't know about this. Get to them ahead of time and let them know before the, uh, before the advocates get into your school and push this stuff. Next slide. Thank you very much, everyone. I'll cut it from here. Appreciate it.